All right, we are recording and welcome to this uh, March uh, edition of Learn with Google, uh, where this month we're talking about um, some generative AI. We've talk, we call this Art Gemini, ideas for writing great Gen AI prompts. And I've got some special guest teachers joining us today who have done some work in this space and we're willing to share it with us. So just before we move into the official part of the proceedings, uh, Steve, I'm going to throw over to you for this welcome. Oh, kia ora, Chris. Thank you very much. Tihei mauri ora. In the maunga whakahi, uh, in the wai tuku kiri, <clears throat> ki te tūpuna te nā koe, a tēnā koutou katoa. And welcome in everyone today. Um, and while we are paying respect to our ancestors, to the house and to our land, I'd also like to um, respect Nga Iwi Māori as the tangata whenua of Aotearoa, and know that we are committed to upholding the partnership of the Treaty of Waitangi. So kia ora everyone, welcome in. Thank you, Steve. And over here on the West Island of New Zealand, uh, we'd like to, like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which we meet, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. And we'd like to honour the presence of the ancestors who reside in the imagination of this land. And, and it's not really the West Island. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, here's our team. Uh, there's everyone who works on the team. And it's uh, it's we have some of them here today, but uh, just in case you ever wondered if there's real people at the Google for Education team, there actually is. Um, here's our agenda for today. Uh, we're going to be looking at some ideas for writing some great Gen AI prompts. I'm just going to take you through what's kind of an, an entree, if you like, to the idea, uh, give you a couple of sort of general principles that we, we tend to use. Uh, then I'm going to throw over to our friends Andrew Corney from New Zealand and Wes Warner from Australia, who have done some, some of this stuff in their classroom and they'd love to share it with us. Uh, and then, of course, after that, we'll go into our usual what's new with Google for Education, where I've got a couple of cool things to show you that have come out in the last uh, 30 days. All right, uh, let's kick it off. So uh, no doubt you know that um, we renamed BARD, uh, our generative AI model recently, um, <laughs> changed its name from BARD to Gemini. Uh, so just a quick introduction about some, some of the background on um, on generative AI and how we actually got to where we are. And I'll, I'll try and keep this pretty brief. But if you look at the history of programming a computer, you know, we've, we've gone through several distinct phases. There was the traditional programming phase where you literally had to tell the computer, you know, let's say you're talking about a cat in this example, um, you know, telling a computer what a cat is, you literally tell it everything about a cat so it knows what a cat is. Um, in around 2012, we moved into what's called a neural network or a machine learning model. Uh, where we could do things like if we showed the machine enough pictures of cats, it would eventually start to recognize a photo that, of a cat that it had never seen, and it would be able to detect it was a cat based on all its previous learnings. And then the last couple of years, we've moved into this thing called a generative uh, language model, a generative AI model, which is essentially like saying to a computer, go and read this huge pile of books, and now that you've learned everything about everything, tell me what a cat is. Okay, so they're very distinct approaches to the way we think about how computers uh, understand the world around them. Um, it's really true that AI is now used in our everyday lives and certainly here at Google if you look at um, many of the products that you use in the Google world, uh, you know, you'll find that AI is at the heart of many of them and often in very subtle ways that you might not even think about. So for example, when you uh, when you go to YouTube and it suggests the next video that it thinks you might like, that's based on things like your algorithm of what you've previously watched and what it thinks you're interested in and things like that. Uh, Google Maps finding you the most efficient route to your destination. Um, Google Translate being able to move from one language to another. All of these are examples of artificial intelligence sort of baked into a product. So you maybe don't even realize you're using an artificial intelligence product, but it's really based on those technologies. Um, if you start to think about uh, where these AI um, sort of uh, instances start to appear across the Googleverse. Uh, starting way back in 2015, when we started to do things like suggested actions in Google Docs, all the way through to things like smart replying. And I'm sure you're all aware that you know you can start typing an email and it will try and finish a sentence for you, or uh, just the fact that Gmail can detect spam, um, noise cancellation here in Meet, where it can listen to the, so the truck going past my house and you don't hear it because it's cancelling it out. So there's a lot of really clever ways that AI is being used, again, in the background in really subtle ways that we think improves everybody's lives. Um, Google actually has been quite a pioneer in the AI space. Back in 2015, we uh, we acquired a company called DeepMind. And, uh, and made a big headline back in the day because we actually uh, 
had a machine beat a human in a very complicated game called AlphaGo. Uh, and since that time, we've come up with many iterations and inventions and innovations in the artificial intelligence space. The one in 2017 is interesting to me because you can see there it says Google invents the transformer. Uh, transformer is a kind of text technology that is able to predict words from previous words, basically. Uh, and we originally wrote that technology to power Google Translate um, and being able to sort of have a computer translate from one language to another without necessarily teaching it all the words. We just gave it lots of examples and it inferred the rest. The T in ChatGPT stands for Transformer. So in fact, all of this Transformer technology that we invented back in 2017 and then open sourced actually powers many of the other innovations in this space at the moment including um, some of our competitors as well. Uh, so we have we have many, uh, many um, uh, developments in that space. I think it's important for teachers to understand that there's a bit of a distinction that's going on here in terms of which of our AI products belong where. So Gemini, which is the one you can use by going to gemini.google.com, just in any browser window, is a consumer level product, okay? So when you go to that window and start using it, you don't have any of the protections that you do uh, with, say, Google Workspace. Um, and you're probably aware that you know using your Gmail account and using your school Workspace account, uh, even though the products look quite similar and they behave basically the same way, the underlying uh, policies and protocols and data protections behind the education version of the product is quite different to the consumer version. And that's very much the case here with the stuff you'll find in workspace versus the stuff you'll find out in the consumer world. And it's really important to be aware of that. If you put uh, prompts inside Gemini, you are helping build the model of Gemini's understanding of the world. Uh, so that's why we strongly recommend if you're using Gemini, you uh, consumer Gemini, you never use school data. You never use student information to put into that. That would be uh, not a recommended idea. We do have a set of products that are designed for use in education. One of them, which is uh, available now, but um, is, is still very, very new, is called um, uh, Gemini in Workspace, okay? Because we try and keep names simple, but we still confuse everybody. Uh, so there's outside Gemini and there's inside Gemini. Uh, and the Gemini in Workspace is when you start to have all of these generative AI things popping up inside Workspace. So be able to generate within a Google Doc, being able to create an image inside Google Slides, being able to have Gmail write the email for you, okay, inside Workspace. It's a very different thing to the consumer one, important distinction. And we've also got a whole bunch of products inside Workspace, uh, like practice sets and read along and uh, others that are coming that use AI to power the things that are happening inside there. And again, they're all protected, or they will be all protected by the, um, workspace terms of service. And then the other side of it is what we call the enterprise or, or the cloud uh, aspect of things. That's the, cons not, it's, what are they called? The, well, the, yeah, companies, enterprises. Uh, and in, in the Google Cloud world, we call that Vertex AI, and that's an artificial intelligence model that companies can use through our APIs to power their own applications and sort of build our AI into their tools. So that's just a kind of an overview there of how that all fits together. Um, regardless of what we're doing with AI, we've always had these uh, AI principles that sit behind what we do. Uh, and you can read those seven there, I won't read them to you, but we, we're we very um, cognizant of the fact that AI is a uh, uh, an area of computing and of society that is very new and we're trying to be very careful about what we do with it because there could always be downsides. And if you've been following the news, you notice that we got you know, some some bad press recently for some things that happened and you can't predict every eventuality. And uh, so, but we try really hard to make sure that the decisions we're making around AI are intended to be in the best use possible. Um, and you can read more about that. There's a link down the bottom there. Uh, if you just go to ai.google, don't worry about the rest of it, you'll find it once you're there. Um, there's, there's some good information on that web address. Um, we do take those principles and try and apply them in an educational sense as well. Uh, so we ask ourselves questions like, is it appropriate for education? Is it clear to educators what the benefits are? Is it helping people? You know, blah, blah, blah. Again, I won't read them all to you, but um, 
we've been trying to make sure that whatever we build for the education space particularly is really aware of the potential pitfalls and possibilities of what AI can bring to the world. Uh, very cognizant of that. Just finally uh, in this section there is um, this idea that, you know, how how can AI actually help educators? And I'm hoping, I haven't, I haven't looked at what Wes and Andrew are going to talk about, but I'm hoping that what they will tell me backs some of this stuff up. Uh, if you look at all the things that teachers do on a daily basis, you've got things like preparation, administration, evaluation, student coaching, professional development, and so on. There are some areas in here where AI doesn't really contribute much in terms of time saving. So things like dealing with students' um, behavioural, social and, uh, and emotional skill development, for example. That's a very human thing and probably should remain one. But if you look at other areas like, say, preparation of work, like preparation of lessons and so on, um, there's a good chance, the size of this bubble, the white bubble, is like how much time it's been estimated can be saved through the use of artificial intelligence. So the, the, the numbers tell us that teachers on average spend about five and a half hours in preparation, and it's possible to save about five hours by using artificial intelligence. That's what this chart is trying to suggest. And you can see how that applies across the other areas. Whether those numbers are right for you or more or less, it's up for grabs, but um, this is certainly based on some research that we've done. Bottom line is, we're seeing the future of AI in education as a possibility of being able to save teachers time is the bottom line. Um, we've already got AI surfacing things like practice sets and in read along and it's just getting better all the time. And we're also, I mentioned before, the Gemini in workspace and these are some of the ways we're seeing Gemini, Gemini being integrated inside Google Workspace. And you can see there things like, you know, helping you write in Gmail or uh, one very cool thing that I don't know if you've ever seen it before is in Google Meet now, you can actually click a button and ask Google Meet to uh, take the notes for you for the meeting and it will send you a Google Doc at the end of the meeting with all the notes of who said what and what the action items are. It's really neat. Uh, and there's some other cool things happening in that space as well that we haven't announced just yet. Um, but as you can see on there, there's lots of ways that AI is being integrated directly into the tools. So exciting times ahead. Um, just really quickly, uh, Prompt writing. How do you write a good prompt? Uh, and you can see, like, if you just go to, now these are not particularly great prompts, but I was messing around with this uh, last year sometime and just exploring it and just coming up with things. Even though these prompts don't conform to the thing I'm about to show you in the next slide, just writing something as simple as that can turn out pretty amazing results. Just asking it to create a lesson plan for year eight students on the topic of earth science, blah, blah, blah. The more specific you make a prompt, the better the result is likely to be. Um, and that's just some simple exam examples there. This website at the bottom, by the way, uh, definitely worth a visit, www.promptingguide.ai. There's some really great advice there on how to construct prompts if, if this is an area that's new to you. Um, some of the components of a high quality prompt. So there's five things you should think about when you're writing a prompt to an AI. Um, first is to establish a persona. So tell the AI what the role is that you'd like completed. So uh, I am a teacher of a year three class um, of Australian students or New Zealand students, right? So describe what the role of the um, persona it should act as as it's performing its task. Then tell it the, what the task is. Describe in detail what you want the assistance with. Format and tone is, is tell it how you want the results displayed. Do you want bullet points? Do you want a table? Do you want it to give you, um, you know, a, a long description? Are there particular words or phrases that you'd like it to use? So be really specific in how you'd like it to look. And if there are any context or constraints, uh, make sure you include those as well. An example that's got here, you know, that uh, I'm teaching a year five class in an Indonesian school. We've explored sustainability, but we haven't learned about food waste yet. So tell it what any constraints or restrictions are. And then finally, if you've got any examples, and this is something you maybe you don't have, but if you do have an example of what you want, that can often help the AI as well in knowing what it is it's supposed to give you. Hey, Chris, I was having a look at, um, I was having a play with Gemini, well, not a play, I was using Gemini um, yesterday, and there was a really nice example of, um, of a prompt that says, you are a tutor for a college level science student, mm -hmm. explain photosynthesis, step by step, and then it said, 
An example of the prompt was, and and create five questions to check my understanding. So mm -hmm. it's you through photosynthesis as if it was a tutor and then said, here are five questions to ask based on what we've just done. So it actually followed a really nice idea of giving some information, doing something, and then doing a follow-up activity to check your understanding. So you're right, that, that design of a prompt is super important and thinking yeah. about it as an educator. The other aspect too, Steve, that uh, I've become much more aware of lately is, you know, these are all chatbots. And I think we put a lot of emphasis on the bot and not enough on the chat. Um, because often when you ask a prompt, one of the things you should build into it is to say that if you're not sure what I mean, ask me a question, ask mm -hmm. a clarifying question. And the, the bot will come back and actually say, you know, um, you know, what age are these students or, you know, it'll clarify the thing if, mm. if you ask it to clarify and then you start a conversation with it and that's when it actually gets better. So, you know, focus on the chat part as well as the bot part. Exactly. So here's an example of a, a high quality prompt. So the basic prompt in this case might be generate 10 highly engaging name ideas for a curriculum project on reducing food waste. A much better prompt is to say, Act as an expert learning designer for secondary students with a focus on sustainability. Generate 10 highly engaging name ideas for a curriculum project on reducing food waste. Respond with a bullet a list of 10 creative name ideas. The project will be for a year eight class in a secondary school in Jakarta. Uh, and then you can give it some examples of things as well. So that's what I mean by taking those five steps and sort of making, you, making sure you try and include as many of those into the prompt as you can uh, to try and build those engaging prompts. Um, there's another one as an example. I, I won't read this one to you, but uh, you can skim through that. But I, the important thing is you can see the idea then be, between what most people do is to just ask almost like a single sentence versus writing something that's much more detailed. And really, the more detail you give it, the more more uh, likely you are to get the results you're after. And I'm hoping that now as Wes and Andrew take us through this, that they will give us uh, examples of how that works. Uh, just before I hand over to them, there was a great article on Medium the other day that I just wanted to uh, call out to you. Uh, I put a link there if you want to have a look at it. It's bit.ly slash genai underscore map. Um, and uh, this article actually went through and looked at five, sorry, four main areas of the things that teachers do and then looked at various aspects of it. So in teacher practice support, for example, there's lesson generation, instruction coaching, teacher advising, and so on. Uh, and they went through and they actually mapped all the different AI tools that are currently floating around out there and how each of those tools map to each of those different areas of uh, the sorts of work you do. Um, I didn't like the fact that they didn't include many Google tools in this list, but hey, I want to play it fair. I thought it was an interesting map to just show you how uh, these AI tools really are sort of, you know, they're, they're starting to become something for almost everything you want to do. The uh, the ones that are not colored, by the way, the, the white squares, are ones where they could not yet find any AI tools to do that particular thing. But the writer of this article made the point that when they did this chart a few months earlier, it was almost all white squares. And now it's nearly all yellow squares. So it's something that's changing very rapidly. All right. With that, my friends, I'm going to hand over to Mr. Andrew Corney uh, from New Zealand. Uh, and Andrew, I will hand it to you, my friend. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, so uh, I'm a teacher down at a little wee school in uh, Queenstown. Um, and uh, we, I guess, are rushing cautiously uh, into the whole AI space. Um, and part of that is not only bringing our teachers with us, but also bringing our learners. So I've got a couple of examples um, just to share quickly with you. So on this slide here, and I think when the slide deck gets shared out with you, you can access all these examples uh, and yeah, feel free to make copies of them if you find them useful. So I'm gonna go through a, a workflow for, uh, for teachers uh, and in terms of one of those Things that AI is really good at is to assist you in your uh, your planning. And uh, then a couple of examples of some tasks we're trying to do uh, or that I've had learners do in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Andrew, uh, so I've just, I've just dropped of, the link um, that slide in the chat. So it's an AI use. You can see the images there on the right-hand side of the slide. So we're doing a, a, my students are doing a unit on future technologies. And so trying to predict what Queenstown is gonna look like in the future. and just interesting, you know, Chris mentioned about those two different varieties of Gemini. So the bottom image is exactly the same prompt. So same prompt used for both images. 
That is from um, Gemini within slides. So, you know, within slides, you can add an, an image. And then the top one, again, exactly the same prompt. That is Workspace Gemini Chatbot. So, yeah, just really interesting to, to see with the same prompt, just the subtle differences um, that you get. And I'll come to some more image examples uh, a little bit later on. So firstly, yeah, for educators, you know, realize that um, it can be challenging for staff to go beyond just really basic prompts. And I think Chris has done a, uh, shared a really good example of the different layers that you need to put into a good prompt. And so one thing that I've tried to do to help out staff is provide the prompts for them. So this first document on the left side, that's a, a project planner. We call them explorations. And so the workflow is they just copy that first prompt into their um, into their chatbot, uh, and um, for our, for us it's uh, it's Gemini, um, and then this idea of giving it an example. So that's a um, a prompt that's going to wait until you copy uh, an example of a partially completed planner um, for you. And I found that rather than just starting with a, a generic prompt, if you give it something that's partially complete, usually the outcome is a lot better. So, you know, we've got a fairly standard planning template, but I included in that a blank template a description of what each part is. And so the AI model picks up that description and then gives a, a more accurate result. So the workflow is put the prompt in the in the chat box. So, sorry, previously I've added as much detail as I can to my planning template. Put the, uh, the prompt in, copy the planner into it, and then um, what it gets out is it basically fills in the blanks. So I then just go and delete that description uh, column. And, and there's a, a pretty good first draft of a unit planner. And then obviously you've got to add um, some human intelligence. So we talk to our kids about, you know, 80-20. Yes, yeah, so for certain tasks, AI gives you 80% of the final thing that you want, but you've got to add 20% of HI or 20% of human intelligence. Uh, second uh, couple of examples I've got is this one is in a design thinking process. So this is part of uh, a bigger slide deck. And again, you can access that. I think Chris has posted that in the chat. And this is the first stage, you know, empathizing. So you can use this as a reverse persona prompt. So the, the chatbot is going to ask the user questions to help build up the answer. Um, and again, by in this case, when I was trolling it this afternoon, it asked me about three or four questions before it felt it had enough information to then um, spit out a, um, an, an empathy map or empathy interview. And what I say to the, the learners is, you know, you keep that same chat window open because you're adding to the chat as you go through the process. So rather than start with a new chat each time you go through the next phase of the design thinking process, just have it all um, in that same same window and also encourage them you know there's gemini there but also to use the same prompts and different tools because they often can produce some different results and certainly about six months ago when gemini was barred it wasn't good at doing these reverse persona prompts you'd put something like that in, and it would also provide you the answer rather than prompt the user to to write the answer but with gemini it's 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 so much better um so yeah, you, and, and you can take a, a dive in the example there with a few more um, examples. And then just the last one I wanted to show you, it's a real neat um, session last week playing around with AI generated images. And so uh, I guess we I framed it in terms of, you know, in your mind's eye, what do you see? When you see this idea of the future of Queenstown, you know, what can you see now? How might you get uh, an AI image generator to come up with that, with that image? And uh, we had a, a guest expert come in and he talked about using three parts to an image generation prompt. Uh, the first part is, you know, be real specific of, of what you want and order matters. So, you know, Queenstown needed to be quite early on in the in the prompt rather than, than later on. So order matters. Um, the mood that you want the image to have and then the style. And that seemed to produce um, some pretty useful images. And then this idea of iterate from there. So you get the first example and encourage the kids, you know, is that what you were thinking of? If it's not, what else can you add um, to the prompt? And then just as I've got down there, we try and encourage our learners to always um, 
reference or or acknowledge that they are of that they used a generative ai tool and then even better if they can add how they how they used it uh yeah so that's it from me um that's awesome. over to wes good on you thank you wes to you sir hey thank you very much uh yeah well, i'll so give a little round of applause to uh, andy yeah we we sort of follow very much along the things that uh, Andrew's uh, doing as well uh, in terms of that, uh, that uh, yeah, the referencing, wherever using that uh, generative AI. Uh, and that sort of fits uh, a little bit with um, sort of the, yeah, so, sort of the pillars that we've done. So uh, a lot of the, well, the three examples I'll show you today sort of um, hinge on an action research project that I did with my school last year, but effectively trying to look at, you know, you know, nailing down exactly what you want the kids to do uh, with the generative AI, uh, looking at what sort of level of automation that we're wanting the generative AI to take on. And probably the big part is the ethical considerations about using it, uh, trying not to lose the children's voice uh, in the work that they're actually doing. Uh, that's actually quite a good uh, peer-reviewed article, uh, you know, to have a look at sort of that, those general background areas there. So the, the first example I wanted to uh, look at is uh, this one that we're getting the generative AI barred in this case um, to refine the student's idea, not actually rewriting it. So if we click on that particular link there, Chris. Yep. Uh, this will give, you know, and dropping down, it's an example of where a student's work was submitted and it was on medical negligence. It, this was from one of our senior students uh, who were do, was doing their assignment. So not actually asking it for it to rewrite it, but um, going through the particular prompt. So we, we dumped the, the assignment in there and then the, the student was given some uh, suggested structures for writing their um the argumentative essay here. So they were given three different examples, or Bard was given three different examples of how to structure an argumentative essay for, for legal studies. So and Wes, Wes, can I just clarify? So this is student writing we're looking at. You've taken the student's writing and put it in. Absolutely. This is the student's writing. So all anonymized. Uh, so there's no mention of the student, no mention of the school. Yet yeah, this is you know, part of their assignment that they had done. So effectively, that what they were trying to do was seek feedback in terms of were they on the right path? Because one of the things that trying to instill with our students is that the teachers aren't on call 24 hours a day. However, at home, and that's and it's, it's at home when they start to get a little bit frustrated, a bit flustered, you know, with the anxiety starting to build, especially if there's a due date coming through and they don't know where to go. So starting to teach them to use the, the generative AI almost as their own personal tutor along this way. So what it was giving back was specific feedback about where they're actually going well in the structure and giving back, you know, sort of suggested areas for improvement, not actually telling them how to rewrite the task. So the student can then just go away now and start working on that. The aim of this is really sort of like not to lose the student's voice, but really refine their writing. And one of the things I found through my project last year was that the generative AI became a really good leveler for our bottom students, our sounds, you know, our HAs. It now gives them an idea to go, okay, I've, this is how I can put this particular response into a well-argued you know, essay right, to bring them back up to the scratch with some of the, you know, the, the better kids in the class. So that's that's one there. But going back to what Chris was sort of saying about, you know, with the chat itself, one of the things that we're encouraging the students to do a lot more now is to really engage with that bot, drill down. If something's not quite right with the response, question it back and forth. And often, you know, the students will start to get a deeper understanding through that conversation back and forth, which is a very human element trait. The, the second example, and this was a really interesting one, this was with a year 10 student who was doing STEM education and looking at uh, creating a parabolic solar cooker. And they had done their sketch and you can see that sketch there 
uh, there's not much within that particular sketch there. So the, the area that I want you to draw in attention, if you have a look at about where it's actually you know, connected to the stand. And this is, there's not a lot of writing. There is a little bit of handwriting. But when we go into the actual prompt, the thing that blew me away with what Bard came up with is mind boggling because looking at that sketch and we scroll down because we're asking what were sort of the strengths and the weaknesses of this particular design. And A was the label, the different parts of the solar cooker. Um, but scrolling just down a little bit more there. Thanks, Chris. Um, I should put my glasses on. This one, uh, the ball joint that suspends the dish is not shown. Yeah, the ball joint. It just blew me away. It could pick that out of the detail. And I went, wow. And the student was able to go, you know what? Yeah, I sort of know in my head how I want it connected. But on that sketch, I should go back. So they were given that sort of feedback outside of class through, you know, using BARD itself. And I, that just really blew me away last year that it could get to that sort of detail from a hand-drawn sketch. So so you got this drawing uploaded and it looked yes. at that drawing and gave you the feedback? That, that's the prompt, yeah. So that it just blew my mind, man. It, it, this, this was a seminal moment in terms of looking at designing. So we've got a, a big engineering uh, department here at our school and we're starting to look at that now with some of their designs and seeing where are the faults you know where can they improve on their designs from there so that was that just blew me away it was a really amazing day it was yeah i came home thinking wow we've got such a, an amazing tool here on our hands and the the third one is probably you know not as you know mind-boggling but this is you know really good it's about modeling how to set up an ai uh tutor for the students so if we have a look at this one, uh, this is with within my core area of uh, senior business, where I've dumped in the documentation from our education authority, and in this case, the QCAA, uh, of the core content of what needs to be covered for this particular topic. And so through the prompting and engaging through it saying that the students having difficulty with a particular criterion and in this case it was the explaining criterion Queen, uh, the qcaa has a very specific definition of what explaining means so i put that definition in uh, and then get it to yeah, come up with a range of questions uh, to sort of work towards that explaining i then got it then to write some html code to create this as a, uh, a, a website you know, with those questions. What Steve said earlier before about having those questions, one of the great things is you can then prompt it to start saying, well, okay, I want you to apply Bloom's taxonomy to this course content. So you're starting to get that leveling up uh, in order of difficulty with that higher order thinking coming through in Bloom's taxonomy and then providing suggested responses with that as well. And this is a, a great thing for those students with tutoring. Uh, so they can then start having their own personal, you know, chatbots by just grabbing that data from the educational authority, which is freely available of the syllabus, dumping that in, right, and feeding that and engaging with that with, with those conversations. And I haven't got this on one of the slides, but in terms of this is a side project that I'm doing with generative AI with Gemini this year is uh, I'm in a new school and they have a footy tipping and I'm not an AFL person. I'm an NRL, so, but it's AFL and I'm tipping and I'm currently doing quite well. However, this week's tips are really oddball. There's some big upsets apparently according to uh, Gemini. So uh, AFL, I'm hoping to win. But I also put in the prompt, I'm a poor teacher. I need to win this competition, so please help me. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, can we please give Wes, Wes and Andrew both uh, uh, a round of applause? Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. I love the fact that we did really not coordinate on this at all. I didn't really ask you what you were putting in here, but I, we, our stories corroborate, which is always nice. Um, and uh, and just for those who don't know, Andrew and uh, Wes are both um, a Google certified innovators uh, and part of our uh, Google Champions program as well. Uh, all right, thanks, hey, guys. Can I, just, can I just jump in before we jump into the next bit? Yeah. yeah. One thing I did uh, last year playing with Bard was actually give it the New Zealand curriculum to read as well. So 
So here's a New Zealand curriculum. Please create a resource based on this level, this topic, and it will now spit out achievement objectives and descriptors from that curriculum. So if you're ever using something that you don't get some good information back, feed it a link to read effectively and say, hey, read this, then come back to me and redefine what you've just done. Um, it is very good at taking in information because obviously it's what a large language model does. Wow. We live in interesting times. I love it. Um, all right. Uh, so just finishing off um, with just a few things that are new from Google for Education. I've listed them out here. I'm just going to whiz through the first three pretty quickly, and then I'll just try and unpack the last two for you. Uh, just a, a really minor thing. You might notice there's been a change in the sign-in screen If when you're logging into your Google accounts. Uh, no need to panic. We just made a, a slight change just to match it with material design. Um, so that's rolling out at the moment. Uh, this is an interesting one, and I there's you can now annotate a Google Doc. Now, before you get too excited, it's a Google Doc done through Android on an Android tablet, which I know most of you are probably not doing, okay? But I found it interesting that it does say down here that if you do the markup, now I haven't tested this, and maybe one of you can test this for me at some point. I'm assuming if you were to run this on the uh, Google Docs Android app on a Chromebook, you I was just thinking that. that. That was exactly my question. If you chuck the Android app on your Chromebook, would this work? Mm -hmm. Stand by. And I, I imagine it would. Are you doing it now, Steve? I'm going to go. You, we, <laughs> you just did that. So I'm like, I'm going to go and try that now. Okay. So assuming it does, um, that would be an interesting thing for those of you that do that. Um, you, even though you can only currently annotate into the Android app, uh, the any annotations you put into a, a Google Doc are viewable both on iOS devices and in a web browser, which leads me to suggest that we can't be that far from being able to have markup in those other platforms as well. But you know, I'm purely uh, postulating there. No idea. That's similar anyway. to what you can do in, in the Google Classroom app as well. So if you're using the Android app of Classroom, you can annotate and mark mm. up on students' work and hand it back. So I'm guessing it's the same sort of thing. Power in the background again. Muscle brain doesn't understand how engineering works, but kind of seems like the same thing. Yeah, but anyway, I just thought I'd point that out to you in case you were wondering. Um, this is also coming to Google Meet. Um, it's, a, it's a minor thing, but I know some people love this stuff. You can There will be now be a switch inside Google Meet where you can do a portrait touch-up. So if you want to make yourself look younger or get rid of the wrinkles or whatever, you can do that as well. <laughs> coming soon to uh, the teaching and learning and uh, uh, plus editions of Workspace. Um, here are the two things that I think actually are, I think are quite interesting. And one is being able to create a uh, basically a camera bubble inside Google Slides. Because I'm in a Google Slide here, I'm just going to show you how this works. Let me just cancel out of presentation mode. And I'll show you what I mean. If I go up to Insert, you can see I've got this option now, a speaker spotlight. When I choose Speaker Spotlight, I have a whole bunch of uh, shapes that I can choose from. I'm just going to go with uh, maybe, oh, I don't know, maybe maybe the rounded rectangle. I always like rounded rectangles. And I can put myself up there and change the size of it, put it wherever I want. And what it means now is when I go back into presentation mode, and hope I haven't tested this while I'm on a meet call, so hopefully it won't have a, a dispute with my camera. Um, but when you go into presentation mode and use the camera, it should, there you go. So you can see uh, what it's done is it's created a little bubble inside my actual slide where I can put myself into the slide. Um, the way I see this being really useful, oh, that's interesting. It's using, I've got two cameras here and it's using one for each, one for meet, one for the slide. Um, I, Obviously, there's a, there's a use here if you're giving a presentation that you're recording. And you might remember from last month, we talked about this new feature here, which is the um, uh, recording mode. So you can now record your slideshows and spit them out as a video. So now, not only can you record the slideshow, but you can now create these little bubbles of your camera and put them into the slideshow as well. So you know, you're all creative teachers. I'm sure you'll come up with different ways you might use that in your classroom. But I think uh, just being able to do that means now you can sort of insert yourself into some of those recordings that you're making, uh, make it a little bit more interesting. OK, so that is uh, the immersive slides presentation. And this last one, actually, I need to uh, I'll stay out of there. This last one is, um, I thought, really interesting. But I come from a design background. So I love this idea that you can now create fully customized email campaigns using the layout editor tool in Gmail. 
Now, to show you what I mean by that is, uh, let me just come out of here and let me just open a Gmail window for you. Uh, okay, so um, now we, we introduced this feature into Gmail a little while ago that when you compose a new email now, uh, by clicking on the compose button, like so, uh, you've all, you've got this little button down the bottom somewhere. Well, it's not, why is it not coming? <laughs> why is it not? Oh, because it's select the layout. There, it's hiding there. Uh, so you've got this select the layout. This is in the plus edition of Workspace, right? Which I know many of you have. And you can select the layout, and it brings up the option to have different sort of email layouts. So you can basically make your email look a little bit prettier. Um, the new thing that's come out then is this ability now to edit these layouts. If you understand Google Sites, when you click on that Edit Layout button, it actually gives you essentially a Google Sites-like editor for your email. So when you you can go and change the heading, so I can click on that heading and say I want to swap out that article, replace that image with something else. So that add, I can I can come in and add uh, I don't know maybe add one of these blocks to it. So you can start to create an email that looks however you want it to look. So when you send it out, it's it's prettier. And I know, like appearance isn't everything, but you know sometimes it's nice to be able to send something that looks better than just a plain text email. Um, the interesting thing about this is when you uh, when you use this, if I hit this insert button, and it will then insert that into that uh, email um, thread. There, let me just pop this out of its window so you can see. Um, I just think it's got some real possibilities in terms of sending much nicer looking emails. Uh, but the interesting thing about it is. When you save this um, email design, it actually goes into your Google Drive as a new file type called an email layout. So as well as having docs and sheets and slides and Jamboard and everything else in there now, you've also got this new form called an email layout that just lives in your Google Drive. And it means that you can share that file with other people who can also then use the same layout, which is really interesting. So again, if you, uh, if you understand the... Um, the editor inside sites and the way you manage themes and everything, it's exactly the same. So it's, uh, I think some interesting possibilities there as well. All right, let's go back to the share this tab and slideshow. And that's really all we've got for you this week. We're, we're trying to keep these shows a little shorter, uh, down to 45 minutes. I've got one minute left. I'm going to go over slightly. My apologies. Um, slideshow, keep the camera off. Okay. Uh, so, um, also I just want to let you know, for those of you who are uh, innovators or trainers or coaches, um, we do have a new education community platform. Now, this isn't for everyone, unfortunately, but I know a lot of people that come to this uh, do belong to one of those communities. So, if you go to www.google for education community, google for edu community.com, um, you'll find there are, uh, it's a platform which is a community page for these groups to get together and have a place to talk, essentially. Uh, right now, there are two and about to be three different hubs within the platform. There's one for the champions, coaches, innovators, trainers. There's one for administrators. So if you are an administrator of a Google Education uh, Workspace uh, service, uh, this is a hub where you can come and mingle with other, uh, other admins, ask questions, share ideas, etc. And we're just about to open up one to uh, Google for Education leaders. So if you're a school leader, uh, principal, uh, system principal, head of department, whatever, there will be a hub for you guys as well. So uh, so that community is in place now. You can check it out at google for edu communitycom uh, If you try and join any of the communities, it does actually vet to make sure you are a legit member of any of those communities. Uh, Steve. You're muted. Uh, once you finish with the slide, I'll just pop up a little something I saw. Okay. Uh, I'm finished with that slide. I'm just going to wrap up on this one. Um, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'll, I'll hand back to Steve in a second and you can have a chat. Uh, we really would love to get your feedback on each of these sessions. There's a link there. Please, please, please. We promised last month that if you filled out the feedback form, we would send a gift to someone, and we did. Uh, Tracy Catling from Caramba in New South Wales. I don't think Tracy's with us today, but uh, there is a package in the mail on its on its way to Tracy. Um, a nice little swag pack of Google stuff. 
Um, so yes, we will, uh, from whoever fills in the feedback form every month, we'll pick a name at random and send you a little swag package as a thank you for doing that. Um, but if we could, if you could please do that, we really, really do appreciate any feedback that you give us. Um, Steve, I was just going to leave this on the screen for a second. Do you want to talk about what you want to talk about? Um, just leave it on the screen for a minute because I need, do need to show you what I want to talk about. Oh, okay, um, yep. So I'll just quickly share my screen. Um, uh, sure. Well, let me finish this and then I'll hand over to you completely. How about that? Exactly. Uh, just a reminder that these are all recorded and the recordings go into a YouTube list uh, and you can find it there at bit.ly slash learn with Google underscore rewatch. So the link is there. Uh, you've got these slides, so all the links are in the slides. And then finally, if you want a certificate for attending today, uh, there is a link there, bit.ly slash GFE certificate, which you can fill in a form and it will magically create a certificate and send it to you on the spot. Uh, and that is it. All right, Steve, now over to you. Excellent, you thank you. Uh, let me just do this. Will it share this? Ah, there we go. So I installed the Docs uh, Android app on my Chromebook, and oh. yes, it works on a Chromebook. So there you go. So that is the Docs Android app on a Chromebook. When you open it up, it brings up a little pencil in the bottom corner. Hey, presto. Time to annotate over Docs on your Chromebook via the app. Amazing. Good stuff. Good stuff. I love, love the fact that you just went and tried that. Yeah, um, I had to. Uh, uh, there he goes. The, the link to the feedback is in the chat, and I will stop the recording. But just before I do, I just seeing Steve just went and tried something. I'll just relay something else. Uh, someone on our team asked me last night if there were any good um, 3D applications you could run on a Chromebook. And uh, I suggested, and then went and tried later on, if you've got a Chromebook that supports Linux, you can actually enable a Linux container and run Blender, which is like a really like high-end, full-strength, uh, very confusing uh, 3D editor uh, that runs on a Chromebook in Linux mode. So uh, if you've not played with Linux mode and you've got a Chromebook that supports it, it is super easy to do. Uh, and maybe we can talk about that in a future episode. All right, I'm going to stop the recording, but thank you all for joining us today. Really, really appreciate having you here. And we only went three minutes over time. See you all next month.